Good morning. Good morning. My name is Linda Jurgen, and it is my pleasure to serve as your worship associate for the month of October. We welcome whoever you are and wherever you are on your spiritual journey. As a home of liberal spirituality, we are grateful for the religious pluralism that expands our vision and deepens our understanding. Our principles remind us to honor reason and differences, to value and foster social justice, social action, and compassion. Welcome to Tapestry, a Unitarian Universalist congregation. Our subject this month is reason. That's what we're supposed to be talking about. But the problem is, reason is not my strong suit. <laughs> when I was a sophomore in high school taking geometry, every time I went to the board to write a proof, a practice that required reason and logic, I messed it up. It was humiliating. I cried my way through geometry and I never took another math course. <laughs> my native language is emotion, feelings, illustration. That's why I love literature. I think the best lessons are taught through imagery and storytelling, through experiences real or imagined. Jesus took the same view when he taught through parables and religious topics are often the subjects of great poetry. Emily Dickinson describes our longing for a lost peace and tranquility in this short poem using a wonderful familiar image. Eden is that old-fashioned house we dwell in every day without suspecting our abode until we drive away. How fair on looking back the day we sauntered from the door, unconscious our returning, but discover it no more. Today, Reverend Kent is going to depart from his usual sermon giving, and he's going to respond to questions from you uh, in the congregation. So there will be several times during the service where somebody will come by with baskets and you can put your cards, which I hope you picked up at the greeters, I mean at the hymnal table there. And uh, if you write your questions on those, he will um, answer them as he has time for. Okay, if you are a Facebook user, be sure to check in and tell your friends how great we are. Now please take a moment to turn off mobile phones or other beeping devices that could interrupt our worship time together. Also, so that we can maintain a contemplative atmosphere, please hold your applause until after the postlude is finished and the service has ended. As a welcoming congregation, we are glad to have any newcomers with us. We invite those of you who are visiting for the first or second time to please stand and introduce yourselves, if you are comfortable, so that we might have the opportunity to get to know you. Are there any newcomers here? Great. And we have exciting events coming up at Tapestry. For information about them, please check the order of service or on the website. Today, uh, Vernie told us, reminded us, that there is, it's today is Open Mosque Day. And uh, so you might take this opportunity, if you're interested, to go over and check out the mosque, which is across and down the street a block or so. Our various groups and events reflect our vision of being a transformational home for liberal spirituality and a dynamic community <laughs> leader in Orange County and beyond. And now, Jan Meslin will light our flaming chalice, the central symbol of our Unitarian universalist heritage. <coughs> Each morning we must hold out the chalice of our being to receive, to carry, and give back, 
may we know once again that we are not isolated beings, but connected in mystery and miracle to the universe, to the community, and to each other. We meet together on holy ground, brought into being as life encounters life, as our personal histories merge into a communal story, as we take on the pride and the pain of our companions as separate selves becoming one community. May our souls capture this treasured time. May our spirits celebrate our meeting in this time and this place. For we meet together on holy ground. Welcome to our holy ground. Welcome to tapestry. Welcome to our time to worship together. Every Sunday in worship, we pause to remember the sorrows and celebrations that really make our lives what they are. This morning, no one has written comments, but I'm struck by the number of candles that have been lit in silent recognition of those joys and sorrows that affect our lives. So in recognition of those candles and the unspoken and unrecognized joys and sorrows in this room and in our wider world, would you please join me in reading our congregational response? For your joys, we join you in celebration. For your sorrows and concerns, may you feel our compassion. For all that is spoken and unspoken, may the caring of our beloved community sustain you. Now I have a story for our young and young at heart. As they're making their way down here, is there anyone that wanted an index card for a question that didn't get one on the way in? Because this would be the time to grab one. So come on down, kids. <laughs> so earlier, Linda said that we're talking about reason all this month. and. Um, Reason is not the easiest thing in the world, and sometimes big ideas take a lot of time and nurturing to develop. They don't just pop out of the blue. Um, it reminded me a little bit of a garden and the way you have to nurture a garden. So this is a story about a garden that Frog and Toad grew. Frog was in his garden and Toad came walking by. What a fine garden you have, Frog, he said. Yes, said Frog. It's very nice, but it was hard work. I wish I had a garden, said Toad. Well, here are some flower seeds. Plant them in the garden, said Frog, and soon you'll have a garden too. How soon, asked Toad. Quite soon, said Frog. Toad ran home, and he planted the flower seeds. Now seeds, said Toad, start growing. <laughs> Toad walked up and down the rows a few times. The seeds did not start to grow. So Toad put his head very close to the ground and said loudly, now seeds, start growing. <laughs> Toad looked at the ground again. The seeds did not start growing. Toad put his head very, very close to the ground and shouted, Now seeds start growing! Frog came running up the path. What is all this noise? he asked. My seeds won't grow, said Toad. Well, you're shouting too much, said Frog. These poor seeds are afraid to grow. <laughs> My seeds are afraid to grow, asked Toad. Of course, said Frog. Leave them alone for a few days. Let the sun shine on them. Let the rain fall on them. Soon your seeds will start to grow. That night, Toad looked out of his window. Drat, said Toad. My seeds have not started to grow. They must be afraid of the dark. So Toad went out to his garden with some candles. I'll read the seeds a story, said Toad. Then they will not be afraid. So Toad read a long story to his seeds. All the next day, Toad sang songs to his seeds. And all the next day, Toad read poems to his seeds. And all the next day, Toad played music for his seeds. 
Toad looked at the ground. The seeds still did not start to grow. What shall I do, cried Toad. These must be the most frightened seeds in the whole world. Then Toad felt very tired, and he fell asleep. Toad, Toad, wake up, said Frog. Look at your garden. And Toad looked at his garden. Little green plants were coming up from the ground. At last, shouted Toad, my seeds have stopped being afraid to grow. And now you will have a nice garden too, said Frog. Yes, said Toad. You're right, Frog, but gardening is hard, hard work. <laughs> and there ends our story. So you guys enjoy your class and we'll see you in a little bit. So Cheryl, and Connie have <laughs> graciously offered to help organize this question and answer session. So if you have questions that you have written on your index card, they can pick them up at this time and there will be another opportunity to pick up, but this is your, your first opportunity to get those questions in while they're hot. It has to be written down. <laughs> For our visitors' benefit, will you explain why we have so many chairs? Yes, yes, good point. So I was going to explain that as sort of the introduction to the question and answers, but this weekend we have our camp retreat up at the Beneville Pines near Big Bear. So I, we sent at least 30 people up to camp. I came back last night to be able to be here with worship today, but that's why we're a little low in numbers today. So that, that's part of this Sunday morning. So thank you for collecting those. As I was putting together this morning's order of service, I had almost forgotten a pretty significant date that had slipped to the back of my mind until I saw the date on this order of service. Today is National Coming Out Day. Um, it, because of cultural change, that phenomenon of coming out, it doesn't hold the weight that it once did. Um, but I wanted to share a poem with you in recognition of how important that day was and still is in a lot of ways. This poem was originally written anonymously by a gay high school student, and it was adapted by Mark Hicks. It's called Mattering. My father asked if I'm gay. I asked, does it matter? He said, not really. I said, yes. He said, get out of my life. I guess it mattered. My friend asked why I talk about race so much. I asked, does it matter? He said, no, not really. I told him yes. He said, you need to get that chip off of your shoulder. I guess it mattered. My neighbor asked why I put that ramp up to my front door. I said, does it matter? He said, no, not really. And I told him because it made my life easier. He said, is there a way you could make it less obvious? I guess it mattered. A member of my church asked why I like gospel music. I asked, does it matter? She said, no, not really. I told her that it connects me with my Southern Christian childhood. She said, I think you're in denial about your oppression. I guess it mattered. My God asked me, do you love yourself? I said, does it matter? She said, yes. I said, how can I love myself? I'm gay, Latino, disabled, and a Christian in a hostile climate. She said, that's the way I made you. Nothing will ever matter again. So when uh, Reverend Kent asked me to play today, 
he said he was using the sermon time to answer questions from the congregation. And I thought, well, boy, I'll be there for that because I want to see if he really answers questions or if he does some kind of a, you know, a ministerial Jedi trick and just ans <laughs> answers questions with more questions, <laughs> which is legitimate if he does. Tell me how you know love Tell me how it is that you know of, of love Do you know love when you feel someone's caring touch upon your sleeve When darkness is around you and there are things that you must grieve do you know love when you feel compassion stirring in your heart and you hold kind words for your enemies even though your world's apart? I cannot say that I know love the same way as you, but I know something of love in these things too. Tell me how you know faith. Tell me how it is that you know of faith. Is it how you call up courage when you'd rather close the door or when you trust in this moment with no need to ask for more? Do you know faith when you choose to believe that love will conquer fear? Or when you take a bold step forward Though the path is far from clear I cannot say that I know faith The same way as you But I know something of faith In these things too Don't turn away now We have nothing to fear Come closer and tell me something true We have nothing but stories Waiting to be told And when I hear yours I'll know God in you Tell me how you know God Tell me how it is that you know of God Do you know God in the questioning look in a baby's eyes or do you know God in an elder's face worn with age and wise Do you know God in a vision bathed in holy light or in a parent's endless sacrifices through another sleepless night do you know God when you pray to ease your troubled mind? Or do you know God in the homeless that we have left behind? I cannot say that I know God the same way as you, but I know something of God in these things too. So tell me how you know love. Tell me how you know faith Tell me how you know of God Let us join for a short time of silent meditation <laughs> Sit back, take a couple of deep breaths and be in this community of support and caring.
Namaste. Amen. And blessed be. So this morning's sermon, and actually quite a bit about this morning, is out of the ordinary. Today, instead of speaking on a specific topic, I'm going to do my best to answer some of the questions that you bring up. And if you've written any more questions on cards, this would be a good time to pick them up. Any questions out there? Okay. So I want to be clear that the purpose of this exercise isn't to claim that I have the answer to your questions. And it's not a game of stump the minister either. As I've said a lot, um, I typically understand my preaching to be a conversation starter rather than a definitive answer to any particular topic. That's because the way we do theology as Unitarian Universalists is through conversation. We build our beliefs in the midst of a community as we compare and contrast what gives each one of our lives meaning. And we come to understand our beliefs better in conversation and we build relationships as we learn together. That's what Unitarian Universalism is all about. So with that in mind, today's sermon aims to more closely be in the spirit of conversation. So hopefully you've had a chance to write your questions on an index card. Um, it's possible that I, I won't get to all of them today, but I will hold on to any of the questions that I don't have time to get to um, to bring up in future sermons. So with that in mind, Huh. <laughs> Maybe this is Stump the Minister Hour. <laughs> what truth do you know now that you didn't know five years ago? Um, oh. What truth do I know now that I didn't know five years ago? I don't know that it was five years ago, but probably a little longer than that. More like seven. I'm going to cheat a little bit. Um, part of the development in the ordination process is a pretty intensive group series of interviews and papers, and it, it goes far beyond school. Um, and one of those roadblocks was a, a committee of very well-intended people um, pointing out that my biggest strength was not my connection to my own emotional life and my ability to use those in my ministry and in storytelling and making meaning of things. Um, I, could, I was great in school, I had a great time, that was all very reasonable and fit with this month's theme of reason and logic. <laughs> and we, do, as Unitarian Universalists, we tend to live in that world very well and very comfortably. Um, and it took some hard conversations with people who said, look, you got to figure this out because this is a part of ministry. Um, and it has slowly crept more and more into my life of understanding that that's as important of a way of knowing and of ministry and of being fully human in the world. And that those sources of, the sources of knowledge that come from our emotional lives are just as valid and just as essential as what we can read out of a book or what reason or logic can provide us. Um, and that's not a comfortable thing for particularly white men in America that were taught to succeed in a particular logical way. So, yeah, that's what I've learned. Um, how can tapestry and Unitarian Universalist congregations in general increase diversity in their congregations? That's the $10,000 question. 
Um, and that, that's a question that comes up a lot. Uh, the sort of underlying assumption, or the underlying question that I would ask is why do we want to increase diversity in our congregations? Um, a lot of times that question gets asked and it's for the goal of having people who look a little bit different sitting in pews in a Sunday that looks exa otherwise exactly the same. Um, and if that's, if that's the question, then diversity is never going to happen. Um, if the question about increasing diversity in our congregations is about being a fuller manifestation of humanity and the cultural diversity and the music and the worship styles and the ways of thinking and being and child rearing and food and everything that comes with human diversity, if that's actually the goal, um, then it probably is possible to have more diversity in our congregations and in our tradition. But to, to do that, to move in that direction, um, there's a whole lot of letting go of what we understand is the right, the reasonable um, right way of doing things of, of, and making room in our tradition for other ways of being and doing church. Um, so I, I think it's more about sincerely making room than it is about going and finding people of color and saying, come be part of our church and do exactly what we do, because that's not very appealing. That's not a real invitation. So. Is there anything you have struggled to come to terms with or accept either within yourself or in the world at large. <laughs> no, nothing. I accept it all perfectly. <laughs> I'm a Zen Buddhist master. Um, <laughs> anything in particular that I've struggled to accept? Um, Yeah, I, I think we all have things. I think growing up and continuing to grow is a process of accepting and knowing pieces of ourselves um, that we either, no one had the courage to tell us or we didn't have the opportunity to learn before. So yeah, I think all of, hopefully all of us have struggled with accepting pieces of ourselves and that's part of learning and growing. Um, In the wider world, I would say part of that challenge for me comes in understanding humanity, that at some times I want to think that we're really wonderful, loving embodiments of the holy and that we should all just have a group hug and sing Kumbaya and that's what we're all meant to do. Um, and we all know from watching the news or walking down the street that unfortunately that's not the way we live together um, as human beings, as animals in this world, as we're trying to feed and clothe ourselves and are somewhat afraid of difference and afraid of potential competition. Um, so yeah, I think that the thing that I struggle, one of the things that I struggle to come to terms with is sort of that our first principle, the inherent worth and dignity of every person, and knowing that every person isn't always nice. Um, and yeah, so that whole human nature question is a sticky one. So. The word faith gets tossed around frequently at tapestry. What does it mean for the many who may not believe in God? 
Um, that's a good question. The uh, if if faith isn't helpful for you, if it's a stumbling block, if it gets stuck in your throat, then ignore it. Hopefully, atheists in our congregation don't feel like someone is making you identify with faith or God or whatever. Um, if if faith as a word is not helpful for you, let go of it. Um, but generally, when I say faith, it's it's not about taking a leap of faith and accepting a mere. It's certainly not accepting a supernatural miracle. Um, it's more about a a picture of the way you understand the world working, um, whether that's about a very scientific, beautifully crafted. Um, world in which we have the opportunity to live, which is incredibly awe-inspiring and a great gift, or whether it's a personal relationship with the divine that you pray to every night, um, or somewhere in between, which it most likely is. Faith to me is about the bigger picture that we come to understand for ourselves. It's, it's not accepting miracles. Um, it's, it's not blindly doing things. It's about doing the best that we can with what we know um, and, and being responsible about putting those pieces together as best we can. Oh, is Muslim jihadism analogous to the Christian Crusaders? Um, and someone, I'm not sure if this was our collection gatherer, someone just says, good question, exclamation point. Um, is Muslim jihadism analogous to Christian Crusaders? I... My, my very uneducated gut reaction to that question is yes, but I think a much more important answer is my historical awareness of the Christian Crusades is very, very limited. Um, I, and my awareness of Muslim jihadism is honestly what I get through the news, through the New York Times, which also is pretty darn limited. Um, in terms of their motivation and the fruit that they bear, I would say they're quite similar. I think both of those experiences were manifestations of devout piety and religious people doing what they thought was right for their God and for their world. Um, and creating a whole lot of havoc in, in the process. And that's one of the pieces of baggage that we have to carry as a religious institution, knowing that a lot of that that has been done in the name of religion, and we also are calling upon ourselves to act out of our faith to do good works in the world. Um, and that's a very, very complicated position for us to be in as a Unitarian Universalist congregation. Actually, when I was up at camp, we had this, I, I did a workshop that was based on people answering questions on the fly, somewhat like this. And there was this question about religion. Uh, it was They were just prompts. It was religion is dot, dot, dot. And the person who drew that um, basically said that religion was a mess and it needed to be exterminated. <laughs> And then two other people, because they're thinking about things like jihadism and the Crusades, um, the two other people that responded to that first answer were also of the opinion that organized religion is this horrible thing, that the most evil things in human history are the fruit of religion. And I, ha I was doing my best to not say anything because I was sort of facilitating this conversation. But I had to engage at one point and say, the, the great irony of this conversation is that it's happening between three congregations at a religious camp. <laughs> like, 
we, as a religious tradition, we have to own that. We have to understand that we're part of this mess and we can't either, ridiculing religion within a Unitarian Universalist congregation makes no sense to me because we're here participating in religion. It may not be God, but it's religion. So, more cards. God, I was getting nervous. <laughs> we have plenty, okay. What do you think tapestry should be doing that we're not doing now? Um, tapestry is doing a lot, actually. My, my bigger concern at this point, because I see all of the committee meetings, I see the volunteers that are exhausted, I see our staff, particularly the office, trying to juggle communications amongst all these committees. I would be really hesitant to say that we should be doing something new, something additional. Um, I would say that what would be more fruitful for us and more enriching is to more deeply engage the programs that we already have because um, we've got a whole lot going on. What's my vision of tapestry in five years? That's scary, because um, this is not going to satisfy everyone. Um, I was, so I was up at camp this, the past few days with, I think there were 90, maybe 100 Unitarian Universalists. Um, most of them were families, and each one of the children had probably five or six peers to run around with and be its own community all weekend, and they didn't know each other. I mean, some of them had been to camp together before, but most of them were meeting together for the first time, and it was a little pack of four-year-olds running around together, and a pack of 10-year-olds, and a pack of teenagers. Um, and I must have said four or five times, when people question why you want to have more people in a church and have a slightly larger congregation, that's part of it. Because young people need peers to be with. They also need adults who are not their parents to have meaningful conversations and support with, but they need peers. Um, and so in five years, I would love to see us be a little bit bigger, not a mega church, but large enough for our children to have groups of, of peers to hang out with. Um, in five years, I would like to see us not having the conversation every month, literally, of what are we gonna do about our space? Um, we lease this property, it's a beautiful property, it's actually incredibly clean and we have wonderful parking and green space. Um, but my God, we spend a lot of money in rent. And just the sort of perennial anxiety that comes up with what are we doing, what are we doing, what do we do next year, what do we do in two years, do we want to move, do we want to stay? Um, to have some either very long-term vision of where we're going to land geographically or to have made, I, not necessarily to own something in five years, but in five years to have a really long-term goal about our physical space. So, uh, yeah. Oh, what's happened, well, that's a really quick answer. Um, what's happened with the search for a intern minister? Um, last year, we were, we had some grant money to hire a intern minister. So a year of internship is part of the ordination process. I did my internship at Orange Coast in Costa Mesa. Um, and we conducted a search. We found one candidate that we really liked and um, San Diego, we, we interviewed four or five people um, and found one that we knew would be a really good fit for tapestry a larger congregation that we could not compete with came in and swooped that person up, offering them like 
lots of money and two different campuses and just a, an opportunity that they couldn't pass up. So that year didn't fly. We're looking, we were just talking about this at the board meeting on Thursday. Um, there's a possibility of not this church year, but next church year. Um, so what is that, 1617? Yes, so 1617 and 1718 doing two years of half-time internship. So that dream and that possibility is not dead. Um, we're still working on it. Um, and since we're running out of time, this is a good running out of time question, is what is your elevator speech? Um, an elevator speech, for those who don't know, is explaining Unitarian Universalism and the time that it takes to ride the elevator with someone. <laughs> My elevator speech is, um, okay, I'm gonna give you longer than an elevator speech. First, I would say the most powerful thing you can tell someone is why you personally come to church, because, or to tapestry, to this congregation. Um, if it's a person that you know, then you probably have something in common with them and they are going to resonate with whatever it is that brings you here to Tapestry, whether that's the community or the music or a place for your children, whatever it is, your story is more powerful than any reason or logic or theological formula you can give them. But if you want to describe Unitarian Universalism rather than your own motivations, I would say it's a historically Christian tradition that in the 1800s started welcoming other religious traditions, Eastern traditions, love of nature, um, and basically blew open the doors. So what we have today looks somewhat similar to a Protestant church, but we embrace a huge variety of different truths, including Buddhism, atheism, Christianity, humanism, and whatever your own story is. Um, so that's, that's my little elevator speech. We extinguish this flame knowing that the light remains in the warmth and compassion of our hearts until we meet again. And would you take the hand of someone near you for just a moment? It's going to be a bit of a stretch today. Walk softly, speak truthfully, love gently, breathe deeply, live wisely. Go in peace and let the light within you be a blessing to the world. <laughs>